Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come back here and talk, and it's a very humbling experience to be up here giving a lecture for all you know, the people that have had such an impact on my career and my mentors. So anyways, I went back to San Antonio, um, which is where I did my residency. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. I'm going to talk about spinal cord injury. Uh, my main appointment is at a, is at a you know, level one trauma hospital that, you know, it's a county hospital that takes care of most of South Texas um, regarding the severe traumas. So spinal cord injury is, you know, it's a problem of the young male. You know, most uh, injuries happen between the age of 16 and 30 um, in young males. And, you know, these patients, you know, you just feel for them because it's not like the patient that's that's had 20 years of IV drug use that they get an epidural abscess and you're like, well, what did you expect was going to happen? These are people who are in the prime of their life and they made one wrong decision or one bad thing happened to them and now their life has really changed forever. So, you know, I took care of a patient at Cedars last year that was a 26-year-old guy who had hiked to the top of Runyon Canyon. I think I talked about this in one of our conferences that you know, he's up there on a beautiful Friday night in L.A. He's at the top. His friends are videotaping him to put it on Instagram. He's at the very top. Sunset in the background, tries to do a backflip, slips, lands on his head, C2, complete cord injury, and his life changed like this. You know, these people, it, it, it just, it kind of hurts you, too, to, to just, you know, you can almost put yourself in their, in their position. So we can't do anything about the primary instantaneous injury that, they, that happens, you know, when they first snap their spinal cord. But there is something that we might be able to do to prevent secondary injury or promote uh, recovery in the future. So this is a patient that I took care of in Texas. He's given me permission to talk about him in educational talks. His name is Casey. He was a 17-year-old kid from Refugio, Texas. You can see it's a little bit south of San Antonio that came in on a Friday night after a, um, he was in a football game. He was the star player of, of their team. He's 17. Head-to-head -head injury, gets paralyzed, comes in with this. So he's got you know bilateral jump facets, got a disc injury, and, and clearly a cord injury. Has a little bit of flicker movement in his shoulders, but otherwise is a complete injury. He has no rectal tone. So a patient like this comes in. We've all taken care of a patient either exactly like this or similar to this, and you have to think that you know the ER doc calls you and says, "I've got a 17-year-old kid that's paralyzed. Here's the image. What are you going to do?" So what are the considerations? Are you going to give him steroids? You know, it, you know, in the last five years or so, steroids have kind of fallen out of favor since the AANS guidelines in 2013 basically recommended against them. But some people still give them. I gave them at Cedars last year, and, uh, you know, there's a group, and um, Michael Failing's group still gives, uh, gives steroids, so it's, it's an option. Um, are you going to push their blood pressure? Um, are you going to take them to surgery right away? I'm a pretty big proponent of surgery, of hyperacute surgery. But the other option for him would be to put him in traction, put him in tongs, and, and try and get him reduced, and then take him to surgery kind of in a more delayed fashion. Other things that are kind of more experimental at this point are investigational, hypothermia, maybe you're part of a trial. But hydrosteroids, it was interesting. They, they were really the standard of care before there was any evidence that they were working. But for years and years, they were the standard of care. There was legal implications, too. There was a case in, Santa, or in, uh, in L.A. or in Southern California in the 90s. Uh, during delivery, a newborn baby had um, an OC dislocation from the, uh, from the delivery. And there was a lawsuit. It, it was a poor outcome. There was a lawsuit. And the doctors in the hospital lost, not because of the kid's injury, but because they didn't start steroids on time. So again, the guidelines in 2002, when they first came out, the ANS cns Joint Guidelines, said that for the first 24 to 48 hours is an option, but you have to understand that there were side effects um, that were real, um, and they were more consistent than what the clinical benefit was. Those were changed in 2013, basically, to a hard stop on steroids, and there was a level one recommendation against steroids. Between 2002 and 2013, there was really no change, uh, or really no new data but it's kind of a, you know, looking back at the trials. So, th so this story kind of starts in the late 70s, early 80s with the NASIS-1, where patients with spinal cord injury were enrolled at over nine hospitals, or at nine hospitals over seven states, and they were uh, put into a group of low-dose steroids versus a group of high-dose steroids. It wasn't weight-based, it was just one group got 100 milligrams of methylprednisolone and one group got 1,000 milligrams, and then you kind of had a maintenance dose over the course of, of 10 days. They looked at the neurological function at admission and then kind of over certain time points. And they basically found that there was no difference between the two groups. Both groups kind of got better, um, but they really couldn't determine whether 
Uh, it was because steroids were so effective that even the small dose group got better, or was it because that steroids didn't matter and whether you got a low dose or a high dose, it made no difference. But this kind of presented a problem because it was the standard of care and everybody already knew that steroids worked. So it was a problem with the experiment, not a problem with the results. So what do you do? Then you change the experiment. Well, it makes sense that pretty much everything that we give is weight-based dose, and this was just a flat dose. So they wanted to change the, the dose. Uh, there was no placebo. So, so again, that question of whether it was just steroids were so effective that the low dose uh, was already beneficial. And then the timing, you know, we think of if you can intervene earlier, then that may, may uh, be beneficial. So then step two, the NASIS-2 trial comes out, um, an even larger study that now there's a placebo versus a massively high weight-based dose. So this methylprednisolone loading dose of 30 milligrams per kilogram bolus for a 70 kilogram patient, the equivalent, I don't really give methylprednisolone for anything, I don't really know what the dosing is, but it, you know, I think most of us probably use Decadron. The equivalent for a 70 kilogram patient is 390 milligrams of Decadron. It's like, it's just massive. Um, and then that, that continues out for 23 hours. And then the, looking at primary outcome measures, again, at six weeks, six months, and then follow up in a year. So what they concluded was that it kind of worked. So at six weeks and at six months, there was a statistically significant improvement in the motor score, which is what we really care about. But this was only present if the drug was given within eight hours. Now, the paper kind of brushes over that this is based off of post-doc analysis. So this was not their primary intention to analyze. This was based on post-doc analysis. Now, we all know post-doc analysis doesn't mean that it's necessarily untrue. It just means that it's probably less likely to be true. But the media reported as a breakthrough. The investigators reported that it worked. But if you look at it based on how it was, how the study was designed to be analyzed, and you look at the charts down here, you wouldn't really say that those are breakthroughs. That's, that's pretty equivalent. But since they determined that 24 hours works, well, if 24 hours works, then 48 hours is going to really work. So they take this uh, same high dose, everybody gets the same bolus, and it's pushed out to 48 hours, and there's really no statistical difference. Uh, Post-doc analysis showed that there was a benefit of being treated for 48 hours if it was started between three and eight hours, but if you were treated before three hours, then there was no benefit of the additional 24 hours. It's almost even hard to kind of wrap your head around that. But of course, if you go back to how the study was designed to be looked at, it's pretty darn similar. The, um, but of course, as I said, Michael Failings, uh, there's different ways to interpret this data. So their group is still giving steroids and, and at least that's an option. So looking at the blood pressure management guidelines uh, from the AANS, you know, they recommend uh, cardiac, hemodynamic, and respiratory monitoring, which um, makes sense and correction of hypotension. Uh, maintaining the mean arterial pressure goal of 85 to 90. I think most of us do that to some degree, but, but if you look at the story historically of how that started, the original papers and the follow-up papers, it's really uh, not nearly as convincing as what we think of that really works. So uh, out of Maryland shock trauma, they looked at 50 consecutive patients who underwent spinal immobilization and followed by a MAP goal greater than 90. They said 82% of their patients did okay, stable or improved neurological exam. There was no control arm. This was not an experiment. They just said, hey, look, this is what we did. Our patients seem to do better than historical um, controls. You, you got to tell us the cliffhanger as to what you did for that kid, <laughs> but we have to, uh, unfortunately, uh, wrap, keep wrap this up. All right, so um, with that kid, uh, took him to surgery right away. Um, you know, from the time of his injury, he was in the operating room four hours later. That's coming from 100 miles away. Um, oh, wow. Well, the video's not playing, but he's walking. He's back to normal. And, uh, and six months afterwards, he and his mom called a conference call into San Antonio to ask if he could play football the next year. Whoa. Clearly, I said no. Football, football's out of the question. But, uh, <laughs> just, just the fact that somebody comes in that you're worried that you know their life is going to be changed forever. I think, I think kind of the important thing here is that these patients are sick. It is not hopeless. And the traditional thought of people who come in with a complete cord injury 
that is completely going away. So just because somebody comes in, sure, if they have a transected cord, yeah, but just because somebody has a bad neurological injury does not mean that, that it is hopeless.